hobby quick hits. Delivering that breaking hobby news. Directly to your earlobes. You wanna know those hot drops from the car shop? We've got you covered. With your host, John Newman. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Hobby Quick Hits. If you're an avid listener of this show or familiar with my content, you know that hobby history is very important to me. People that came before us that did uh, made many contributions to the hobby and where we are now. I try to give them their just due proper credit. And so we do a show periodically on this show, uh, maybe once every three months. We call it Legends of the Hobby. Uh, thank you to Mike Locke for the recommended name change. And we've done them on, so far, Warren Bowman, Mr. Mint, Alan Rosen, and Blood Denny Jr. And today we're going to do our fourth subject. And if we were ranking the four, probably wouldn't be the fourth ranked person. It would be higher up, most likely. And uh, little local connection uh, with this gentleman, uh, who, by the way, is Mr. Jefferson Burdick, uh, born in Central Square, New York, about 14 miles uh, from me. And there's some other connections uh, as well that you'll hear um, as I go through his kind of biography during the main crux of uh, the episode. Recently, I went to his uh, grave, which uh, is in also in Central Square, New York, and I recently found out he was there. I kind of assumed... He was buried somewhere else. I mean, he went to New York with his collection being at the Met. Thought maybe he was there. But when I found out that uh, he was buried locally, I wanted to go to, you know, the grave site and sort of pay my respect. Um, and I, I did on a Saturday and was shocked. Well, not shocked, but kind of surprised at the condition of his gravestone. And his gravestone is really only... 30 years old, but had some lichen and moss grown on it. Very hard to even see what was uh, written on it. I found it because I used Find a Grave online to find out exactly where it was. And I came home that Saturday, and it was really weighing on my mind about what shape it was in. And so I made a decision to go back Sunday with some tools and cleaning agents and clean it up. You know, put proper respect on his final resting place. And so Sunday I did that. I had posted a post Saturday that I paid my respects and took a picture. And then Sunday I posted another picture that I I cleaned this headstone up. I also cleaned his parents' headstones that were to the left and right of him. His dad's to the left, his mom's to the right. So did that, posted it. Uh, Sports Collectors Daily uh, saw the post. They asked if they could run an article and cover it, uh, which I gave them the thumbs up. So it made the the rounds there and kind of went viral. Got a lot of likes and 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 not really necessarily my goal. I'm, I'm you know, but I think my goal with that of posting it is to just bring awareness to Jefferson Burdick. I think there's a lot of people in the hobby who don't know who he is and should and. You know, leave it, and uh, you know, be a good steward and, and, and kind of lead by example. Like, you know, do things, and not just hobby-wise, but even in jet life in general, to, to do good things when, when you have an opportunity. And so that's where that, that really came from uh, for me. And if it inspires someone else uh, to do something nice, then, you know, that, that's great. And, you know, I've kind of took it upon myself. I'm, I'm going to try to get up there. It's, it's only 14 miles away. I'm going to try to get up there uh, on average maybe once a month, pay my respects and kind of just oversee the kind of maintenance uh, on the stone uh, itself. So there's a little bit of a connection there. Um, you know, we're going to do these. I don't want to overdo them, but we're going to do these probably, you know, four four times a year. Um, I mentioned who we we done already. Let me tell you some that you can look forward to. Probably one more in, in 2023 and the rest of these potentially in 2024. Barry Halper, uh, Arthur Shoren, Cyberger, Frank Fleer, Mike Burkus, and Enos 
Gordon, Gowdy, and then we'll go past that point when, when we get to it. But those are some of the next hobby icons and individuals you will hear sort of honored with these Legends of the Hobby series. MojoBrickShop.com is the best place to get your sealed wax products and breaks. They not only have the best selection, but the best prices. Whether it's a box or a whole case, they are your guys. They ship worldwide to your doorstep. Their reputation as one of the most trusted in the hobby goes unmatched. They are the 2021 Topps Rip Party Champion Breakers. From sports card to Pokemon cards, their selection can't be beat. They offer daily deals and pre-orders. Hey guys, John Newman here. Mojo's prices are already great, but to save an additional 10% off anything in their store, use the code QUICKHITS. That's Q-U-I-C-K. H-I-T-S. Check out the full service store that's open seven days a week in Santa Clara, California, or the website at mojobreak.com. Let's check out this week's Hobby Wax Releases. Take it away, Owen. Hey guys, welcome to Sports Car Shop. Let's go over the week releases. On the 27th, we have 2023 Super Break Supercharged Edition Series 3. 2023 Topps Chrome McDonald's All American Basketball. 2023 Star Hidden Treasures Football Autograph Full Size Helmet Series 2. 2023 Wild Card 5 Card Draw Football. And on the 29th, we have 2023 Leaf Exotic Baseball. 2022 23 Panini Contenders Optic Base Basketball. 2023 Panini Mosaic Football Choice. 2023 Pieces of the Past 7-Year Collection Series 2. On the 4th, we have 2023 Bowman Chrome University Football. 2023 Panini Black Football. 2023 Panini Prism WNBA Basketball. 2023 Panini Select Baseball. 2023 Topps Gilded Collection Baseball. And then on the 6th, we have 2023 Panini Mosaic Football No Huddle. And that's it for you guys. Have a good day. Let's go around the hobby verse and catch up on this week's hobby news. I'm not sure I got to this last time we did the news. SGC has now lowered pricing to fifteen dollars. Uh, used to be twenty-two. Uh, all trading card uh, game cards are nine dollars each, and they are currently running a series two Topps Chrome special at nine dollars each. Some may know I'm a bulk subber for them. I just uh, turned in a bulk sub last week with the new pricing and was worried that it was going to take longer with uh, with them going to be a lot busier. And I, I got to tell you, uh, th- it's on its way back to me very, very quickly. So they're, they're handling the influx. As a matter of fact, this bulk sub it got back, will be getting back to me quicker than the one prior to the lower price announcement. So they are on point, and so uh, kudos to them. Stop me if you've heard this one before, but now WWE has pulled Panini's license to produce their cards, much like last month when the NFL uh, Players Association uh, did the same thing. Panini has responded by... Um, uh, immediately filing a federal lawsuit in New York court to stop that. And uh, at this point, Panini owes $5.6 million uh, for the licensing agreement. And the WWE not only is saying they don't want Panini to produce the cards, they still want that $5.6 million uh, owed, which uh, I don't I don't think you can have your cake and eat it too. But uh you know, little little pull, string pulling, I think, is going on behind the scenes. Uh, WWE uh, said that uh, effective immediately, they would give the rights to producing their likenesses to fanatics. Like I said, stop me if you've heard this story before. Different sport, but same version of events. So we'll have to wait and see how this plays out as well. A lot of, a lot of courtroom uh, battles going on right now. Hobby lawyer Paul Lesko has got to be uh, licking his chops. Speaking of fanatics, Harry Kane, the British soccer star, uh, has signed an exclusive autograph and memorabilia deal 
uh, with Fanatics in the millions, but undisclosed. It's a multi-year deal, uh, so he'll be exclusive to Fanatics there. And we'll close with uh, REA's September auctions uh, are underway, and they end September 24th at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, some great items in this auction. Uh, heavy uh, mantles, including 52 tops, 51 Bowman, and 52 tops autographed. Uh, 3.7 uh, thousand items, so 3,700 items in the auction. Uh, all items start at 10 bucks. That's REA's deal. There's four gold border 1911 T205s that are graded PSA 7. That is the highest grade for those particular four cards. A 68 Tops Venezuelan Maze graded PSA 7. Speaking of Maze, they have a uh, ticket from the catch, you know, the one he made on Vic Wirtz over his shoulder during the 1954 World Series Game 1. They have a ticket from the game. They have a Ty Cobb signed check and lots, lots more. Uh, 3,700 items all at least starting at a $10 bid. Auction runs till September 24th, 9 p.m. Head over to Robert Edward Auctions. Sign up if you're not already and get uh, see what you can get. And now, our feature presentation. All right, continuing with our Legends of the Hobby series, this one strikes close to home. And as you heard in the intro, probably should have done it sooner, folks. But uh, I'm not there. There's no really order to the way I'm I'm doing these. I just have a bunch of names of people I wanted to do eventually written down and just kind of picking one. So these are not in order of how I view them or rank them or anything like this. But again, this this is uh, you know I'm originally from New York City, but been here in Syracuse a while now and this gentleman is or was from the area born in 1900 uh in central square new york which is 15 miles north of here and uh born in march of 1900 uh, not sure of an exact date uh grew up uh, on a farm where central square new york is mostly uh, especially at that time uh farmland it's more developed now, as a young child, Jefferson Burdick worked on his father's farm, but began collecting cards from soda and tobacco car, uh, companies. And he asked his dad to smoke different uh, brands of tobacco so that he could collect them all. He was a completist. He wanted uh, all of them. So as a young child, he, st he got into collecting. He graduated from Central High School in 1918, now known as Central Square High School, and he attended Syracuse University in late 1920. He went there for two years, got a business degree, and after high school or after college, he started working at the Syracuse Herald, now known as the Syracuse Herald Journal, uh, and then he became he worked in the electrical field, not as an electrician, but for a company called Krauss Heinz. Uh, he worked at Krauss Heinz for 23 years. Little funny story, little interesting tidbit about Krauss Heinz. I live three blocks away right now from Krauss Heinz. It's still there, still functioning, um, but recently was uh, purchased by no another company called Eaton, E-A-T-O-N. So it's now Eaton, but up until recently, it was Krauss Heinz. Uh, and, and, you know, who knew that, uh, you know, uh, Jefferson Burdick basically worked in that building three blocks away from my house for 23 years, obviously uh, before I was ever uh, around. He passed away in 1963. I was born in 1972. In 1933, at the age of 33, he really ramped up his collecting again, uh, amassing uh, cards and stamps, uh, quite a big collection. And he, he published one of the first publications pertaining to card collecting called the Card Collector's Bulletin or the CCB. And if you have any of these CCBs in your collection, 
are very rare and worth four figures. So congratulations if you own a copy. Uh, and then he established his own cataloging of cards in the CCB. And that's, you know, many of those uh, pre-war sets, he he named them in a sense, you know, like the T206. He had a system uh, that he used. He gave cards produced by tobacco companies a T designation, much like the T206s. He used E's for early uh, candy and gum cards, and he used PC for postcards. Uh, and then he had some other classifications that uh, are not as, as widely known as, as those. Uh, and then gum cards issued in 1933, he start labeling with an R. He collected more than baseball cards. He collected cigar bands, uh, postcards, paper dolls, advertising, just a, 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 a little bit of everything that he considered ephemera and um, almost like a hoarder. But not only did he collect them, he learned about them. And so he was viewed as a, histori a historian. People would go to him to find the provenance or the background of these you know, releases or, or cards or, or or other things, not just cards, like I said, postcards, stamps, um, and advertising, cigar bands. And he knew the history behind everything he collected. He deep-dived them, you know, before Google. He did all the, the legwork uh, himself, uh, you know, from the ground up. System of cataloging has been called the, you know, Dewey Decimal System for collectibles rather than, you know, library books. And so he started his publication in 1937 as the Card Collector's Bulletin with the system of cataloging cards. Uh, it was also called the CCB uh, for short. Uh, in total, he had around 306,000 cards, which he glued into 394 albums. Today, we know that's sacrilegious. But back then, they weren't viewed as necessarily monetary items. And, um, you know, never a reason for uh, why he mounted them uh, in, in albums. But uh, rumor has it that he was afraid he'd lose them. So by gluing them uh, in the albums, uh, that would not uh, happen. Before he launched CCB, he had written six articles for a magazine called Hobbies between the years of 1935 and 1937. Again, uh, January of 37, he started CCB, and by 1939 had published eight versions. He was known for, you know, it was a price guide as well, and he would uh, put lower values on, on certain cards uh, because he didn't want it to be necessarily about dollar signs. And so, uh, you know, he, he stopped doing the CCB uh, briefly to do his first catalog in 1939. The United States Card Collector's Bulletin, this catalog, uh, was where he introduced that card identification system that we still use today uh, in the hobby. He was a very detailed gentleman, including meticulous with spelling and typeset. And uh, he produced 500 copies uh, of that publication with 100 copies reserved for people who had already previously subscribed to the CCB. In 1939, he started the CCB, CCB back up as a bi-monthly uh, publication with his own printing uh, equipment. Uh, he, he advised people to run ads to acquire cards, visit antique shops, and correspond with other collectors. So he's one of the first people to really, you know, uh, highlight card community uh, before it was a thing we know it uh, uh, today. Did not publish these publications to get rich, and quite frankly, he did not make a ton of money from his work. He made more of his money working at Krauss Heinz. Uh, as, you know, putting uh, uh, detonators together and other electrical things that they 
uh, produced. Um, in 1947, uh, he started to decline in health, starting with some arthritis, especially in his hands, and he started to make plans to leave his vast collection to the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in New York. And starting in 1948, he started to send his collection a little bit at a time to the museum. And then he traveled from the Syracuse area to Manhattan to place the card and album. Uh, he also traveled to bigger cities, Boston, Chicago, to attend card shows and was treated very respectfully for the work uh, that he did. Uh, did. He became a fixture at the Met in the late 1950s when he relate, relocated to New York City and he moved a small oak desk from his hometown into the corner of the print dep uh, department. He was glued to paste his collection in the 640 albums measuring 12 and a half inches by 15 inches. He photocopied the backs of the cards so he had all the vital information after he had mounted them on the pages knowing that the glue would damage the backs. I have one of those cards I recently acquired. It's an 1890 long cut honest tobacco uh, of a unknown named uh, unnamed actress. I'm trying to find out the name but uh, uh, right now I, I have not uh, got the name for that particular card. While living in New York, he rented a room in a hotel near Madison Avenue and 26th Street and received regular cortisone shots that were uh, painful as the arthritis he was suffering uh, from. Uh, Burdick started to realize his time was running out, and he worked more frantically to catalog his collection. And so he picked up the pace, knowing the, you know, the sands in the hourglass were, you know, going through quickly. Jefferson Burdick was known as kind of a quirky, odd guy, friendly, but sort of a loner, nerdy type of guy. Never got married, never had children, and so unfortunately there are no uh, direct descendants of Jefferson Burdick. On January 10th, 1963, Burdick pasted his last card in the album, put on his coat, and announced, I shan't be back. The next day, he checked into the hospital, where he died on March 13th, 1963, at the age of 63. His gravestone was bought by a family friend. He didn't have a gravestone until, I believe, 1997, when a family friend finally bought one. It's the one I talked about uh, in, the, in the intro. And on it reads, one of the greatest card collectors of all times. Uh, the June 1st, 1963 edition of the Card Collector's Bulletin was memorialized to Burdick. Uh, many collectors called them their best friend and their guiding light, known as really the father of the hobby. And so I'll leave you. Uh, I hope you learned some stuff today. I hope, you know, I hope you recognize how important this gentleman was uh, to the hobby. I'll leave you with a couple quotes from the man himself. He wrote, quote, from somewhere, I inherited a love of picture. People hungered for pictures, a window to the past, as they became more available. Every succeeding generation became more forgetful, and the old pictures lost their sentimental value. And the last one I'll leave you with is my personal favorite. He said, A card collection is a magic carpet that takes you away from work, a day cares, to havens of relaxing quietude, where you can relive the pleasures and adventures of a past day, brought to life in vivid picture and prose, end quote. And if that doesn't sum up the hobby, or should, I don't know what does.